my name is Lauren Brown, and I'm the Clinical Director of Acubalance Wellness Center in Vancouver, and I'm talking to Dr. Paul Magarelli, CNY Colorado. Um, now, you know, I got to give the full transparency. I do know Dr. Paul Magarelli. We've known each other for many years, so we are colleagues, and, um, and we've become uh, good friends as well throughout the years. And although I may not always agree or, or like what Paul has to say, I always respect what he has to say <laughs> and, um, and he knows. And that's why I thought I'd get you on again today, Dr. Mag, to talk about fertility. For the listeners, can you kind of share a little bit about your background sure. um, of your training and what you're doing in practice? Well, first and foremost, thank you, Lauren, for, uh, for just asking me to talk about something near and dear to my heart, which is uh, improving egg quality and hopefully making mommies. I mean, that's really what we're all about. Um, and yes, we are friends. And yes, I do disagree with you at times, but I always respect you also for the amazing amount of work you've done to educate not only the public, but to create a professional platform for uh, acupuncturists, for um, chiropractors, for nutritionists, for integrated medicine docs to have a forum for us to do these kinds of uh, discussions. So I, I just tip my hat to you and I'm very proud to be called your friend and uh, thank you for again, inviting me. Um, my background is broad and, I'll, I, I, and it started mostly as a scientist. And what I've come to realize is that uh, starting as a scientist in the field of reproduction, I was a, a reproductive scientist in marine animal reproduction and that really colored my, my approach to our medicines, both Western and integrative, in that I didn't have a particular buy-in to Western medicine or, or Eastern medicine or any medicine because I was into the science of it. And I'm accused both positively and negatively of using science um, as a framework to discuss many, many different things. So I did my PhD in, in marine animal reproduction and then I went on to uh, Duke University to do my residency. And then I went on to uh, UCLA to do my fellowship in reproductive medicine. And that's almost getting there towards 25 years ago. Um, the, the pivot to integrative medicine came when I was introduced to uh, my wife, is Dr. Diane Credenda, and she is a, uh, an acupuncturist and a colleague of yours also. Um, she presented the concept that maybe adding acupuncture could improve outcomes in my patients. And at that time, putting it in perspective, the best we could expect for folks to achieve a pregnancy with uh, any kind of fertility, uh, high tech fertility, was between 20 and 40%. That was considered state of the art. Because this was the early 2000s. Yes, this is 1999, 2000. And um, because of my background in science, you know, I, I certainly didn't know much about acupuncture. And, and, and from my standpoint, you don't provide care unless you have tested it in some fashion uh, scientifically. And as you know, when I first met you, it's always about the data. What's the data? What does the data show? And Diane jumped in, did research with me. Long story short, we helped create uh, the Credenda Magarelli Acupuncture Protocol. We helped develop the American Board, as you did, of uh, reproductive medicine. I teach, I helped create the program, doctoral program in, uh, uh, in oriental reproductive medicine at Yosan. Um, so it's been an intimate part or an integral part of my life. And uh, thanks to you, I've had the chance of speaking to many, many people around the world at your uh, Integrated Fertility Symposium in, you know, in Vancouver, which I miss, by the way. So in brief, that's my background. And so uh, I'll share that. So Dr. Magarelli is an advisor for the American Board of Oriental Reproductive Medicine. And the research that him and Diane Grandenda did um, showed that um, adding acupuncture in the stimulation phase, as well as around um, transfer day, um, for, I think it was poor responders, increased um, pregnancy rates and lowered miscarriage rates. Correct. And then we brought in that to all responders. And although not statistically significant in every one of our studies, and some of our studies had at least 800 people in it, which is some of the largest studies in, in the world, we always found that the trend was always towards more, more pregnancies, fewer miscarriages, the elimination, almost the elimination of ectopic pregnancies. And then and this may be uh, counter to what folks want, but we also found that acupuncture would create a better 
uh, way of having a pregnancy in that we had lower uh, multiple and higher order pregnancies. Um, and now that's ancient history, believe it or not, because there's been many, many other studies, many meta-analyses, and there's controversy as in all of medicine as to the, the specific efficacy and who can be best helped. But we'll talk a little bit more about that when we talk about egg quality, why there's some very unique information that relates to, to egg quality. And so now here we are recording this in 2022. So many years have passed. You have a lot of experience, more research, and we want to talk about egg quality and for the men and women that are listening here. So embryo quality, because sperm can be involved as well. Of course. You share the integrative approach. So what are you seeing in the outside your scope practice, like the diet, supplements, acupuncture, laser therapy, as well as what are you doing now in the West? You can do sure. genetic screening and there's certain hormones and drugs you're using to help and I'll preface it because back in my, when I started practice in 2000, a lot of the reproductive endocrinologists said, you're 36 and that's as good as you get and egg quality can improve. That was um, over 22 or was 22 years ago. So what are they saying now? Can, um, are all 36 year olds created equally or all 40 year olds created equally? And is there something that couples or women can do to increase their odds, whether they're trying to conceive naturally or through an IVF using the resources available as of 2022? Yes, there are changes. And uh, yes, there are things that can be done, but let me, let me frame it for you. Um, when, when historically folks said you can't improve egg quality, they actually didn't have a measure. Um, at that time, we didn't look at um, mitochondrial assays. We didn't understand the role of growth hormone. We didn't, we had many, many uh, gaps. And what they really were saying is in our experience, uh, folks who are over 35, you saw a, a significant drop in their uh, ability to achieve a pregnancy with technology like IVF at that time. And of course, at that time, that was growing into day three, which is a, a, a cleavage stage embryo. Uh, it's after fertilization growing at uh, two or three or four days. Um, of course, many, many changes have happened since. And I'm, I'm gonna always cut to the chase because I don't know, you know how much detail you wanna get into, but he, here's the 2022 approach. And we now know almost irrefutably, if you can say that in our field, that adding growth hormone, regardless of age, to a protocol for patients will improve outcomes in terms of the, the oocyte quality and also the subsequent embryo quality, blastulation, in other words, the number of blastocysts that you get. And there is some strong suggestion in the number of euploid or normal uh, uh, blast blastocysts that we can achieve if you augment with growth hormone as a, as a, as a uh, injectable medication, you prime the patient, you give it to them. Uh, here's the interesting thing. In studies that Dr. Cronenna and I, we haven't published it yet, but we put it out for abstracts. If you do that, you do see this improvement with growth hormone. But if you add acupuncture to that mix, you actually see an, a synergistic improvement especially in folks over 35. So what is 35? Now, here's the magic of 35. Right, uh, right now, uh, uh, um, we understand that the rate of egg loss accelerates after approximately age 34, 35, 36. So typically a woman will lose about a thousand eggs a month as part of her normal human biology. At 34, 35, 36, they, they accelerate the egg loss. So there's a, there's a clock timer and that timer is saying, okay, we really don't need to reproduce at this age. And therefore having eggs, having children doesn't make sense physiologically. And that's based on uh, the fact that, that uh, primitive man, uh, cave man lived approximately 25 years of age. So making a baby at 45 doesn't make a lot of sense if you're dead for 20 years. And I say that with tongue in cheek. Um, so there's a dramatic change in something. We went back and looked at all of our acupuncture data. And what we found is the most significant improvement in reproductive outcomes came after 35. What's really interesting is now with pre-implantation genetic testing of embryos, 
it was thought, and I was one of the biggest proponents, that everybody should do genetic testing of embryos. And again, this is about quality, and, and, and I'll bring the story back here. Uh, so that we did uh, do a recommended PGT for everybody, and especially for those with recurrent pregnancy loss, et cetera. Well, what we now know is there's this magic period between 35 and 40 where that is where PGT helps patients. Otherwise, it really doesn't help you get the maximum number of babies per retrieval. There's some, and, and, the, and, and it goes on and on and on in the literature that something happens. For example, we just did a quick study on looking at letrozole addition to an IVF cycle, not a study, reviewed some, some data. And uh, what we found is that prior to age 35, adding letrozole did not help patients, actually it may hurt, between 35 and 40, adding letrozole helped. After 40, it hurt. Something between 35 and 40 is that magic time. So what's going on? Well, there's a change in growth hormones secretion quite dramatically. There's a change in our physiology. It's called advanced maternal age for a reason. Um, uh, in terms of uh, in, 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 uh, in problems with pregnancies. So what we have found is by adding growth hormone, by adding traditional Chinese medicine, now the growth hormone can, uh, improves outcomes, how? And that's where we can talk about how, are, how can you help, and I can talk about nutraceuticals also, but how can you help the quality of your egg? Well, let's go down that road then of how, because that's what I think our listeners are really interested in. And so 35 to 40, there's changes that are happening that we're starting to understand. Obviously, we never have the full picture, even when we think we do. However, you are seeing outcome changes, which is the yes. important factor. And so you can add growth hormone to your to your um, IVF. And then what about, because your background, PhD in, in, um, in, um, in with nutrition. The biology and nutrition, nutrition. nutrition. I know that you you have um, lectures um, for the naturopathic and acupuncture community on our platform on insulin resistance and dietary therapy. So I know um, you're very well aware of how that impacts the cellular level. So what are some of the, are you doing dietary? Are you doing nutraceuticals as in supplements, the acupuncture, and are you doing Chinese herbs? Because some clinics years ago didn't want any Chinese herbs. More and more clinics are using, are, are comfortable having their patients on Chinese herbs. Curious what you're doing over there at CNY Fertility in Colorado. Well, let's start with the, the nutraceuticals. Um, there is a product on the market called Ciro Vital. Ciro Vital is, a, is, um, is specifically designed as a growth hormone secretagogue. A growth hormone secretagogue is something that augments the natural production of growth hormone in the body. It does it by inhibiting somatostatin. Somatostatin is a is a hormone that inhibits growth hormone secretion and it and it increases over time as we age by adding this complex of amino acids herbs and um, and specific types of compounds that that shuttle amino acids into the across the brain blood brain barrier called oxoproline you can have a 600% improvement in your own body's production of growth hormone. Now, the interesting thing here is that the product itself is fairly inexpensive, which is very odd for us in the field of reproductive medicine. So for example, if you take a growth hormone injection, pure growth hormone, you're gonna be spending anywhere between 500 to thousand dollars a month in adding this particular um, pharmaceutical to your hormone, to your regimen for, 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 for uh, improving your reproductive outcomes. Ciro Vital in the United States is on sale often at, um, at Costco for about $70 for a 40-day supply. Um, now, the Ciro Vital itself and functions at the level of our nutrition. What do I mean by that? Amino acids are very well known to improve growth hormone secretion. So not specifically those in serial vital, but many of the neutral amino acids as other amino acids improve growth hormone secretion. Vitamin C improves growth hormone secretion. Um, fasting, fasting significantly increases growth hormone secretion. So intermittent fasting, which is something that we strongly support at CNY Fertility Colorado, and I've always supported. 
um, zero vital, vitamin C. Um, uh, and now the, the funny thing is where do we get most of our, pro, uh, our amino acids from, of course, is protein. So a high fat, uh, a high protein diet would, would provide impetus for the body to produce more growth hormone. Exercise, movement, it, 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 uh, sleep increases growth hormone secretion. So this idea that you have to have some, some uh, very expensive medication to improve outcomes falls really pretty much on, on, on um, unfertile ground because there are things that folks can do with their lifestyle. And this is where integrated medicine and especially traditional Chinese medicine doctors who are trained in reproductive medicine can help. Now, this is not, I am speaking about eggs and egg quality and reproductive outcomes. However, what's coming to the fore now is about 50% of miscarriages are associated with poor sperm, poor sperm. Uh, so growth hormone certainly has been used many, many decades, if many, many decades for bodybuilders and, and military, a lot of military men use it to maintain their, their muscle tone in war, et cetera. Um, and, but serovital is a very inexpensive way for the husband to improve the levels of growth hormone. And that can improve many, many th different things, which, are, which could include libido. Um, so, so, um, Generally speaking, I have all of my patients on serovital males and females. We absolutely recommend strongly a, a, a list of vitamins, which includes vitamin D3, of course, you know, and, it, and, and, and the antioxidants like um, uh, ubiquinone CoQ10. Uh, we do recommend um, a, a vitamin C, uh, addition, additional vitamin Cs, males and females. Um, and we do recommend intermittent fasting. Uh, which is, can be as simple as a 14 hour break from food. It's not hard to do, but again, that's part of the lifestyle changes. Now I can talk about acupuncture and, and herbs here in a second, but I wanted to kind of compartmentalize. Yeah, well, no, so you're sharing that there is dietary tricks that they can do or dietary yep. approaches. Mm -hmm. There's supplements. So you listed a new one you introduced me to, and then the, the, the regulars that a lot of the people listening probably have heard sure. of. Um, so yeah, let's go down with, um, the acupuncture, sure. herbal therapy. So sure. I think you want to know, the reason I want to ask this is usually the, the phrase I'm hearing more and more is I want to leave no stone unturned. Like women are really saying, okay, um, some of them are doing, saying this before they have their cycle, but majority of them have had unsuccessful cycles. They're like, okay, I got to, I want to be there mentally and physically. I want to make sure I go in there prepared and I'm fit for fertility. I want to reach my peak fertility potential, basically mm -hmm. leave no stone unturned. So can you continue on with, um, what you guys are doing regarding acupuncture what sure. you're seeing from the research you reviewed and your own sure. research and herbal medicine, which is new to a lot of people? Yeah. Let's start with herbal medicine. Um, a few lectures that I gave at the Integrative Fertility Symposium really opened my eyes to the opportunity we have for integrating herbs into the practice. We've, we have now felt comfortable after, after 20 years of adding acupuncture. I think most reproductive endocrinologists, uh, worst case, they may simply ignore it. Uh, best case, they embrace it, but with no longer the worst case is they reject it. So the, the use of acupuncture, I think uh, I certainly would say that probably 90 to 95% of every website for, for IVF in, in the United States, because that's what I can speak to, has something about acupuncture in terms of utilizing it in, 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 in coordination with their IVF cycle, whether they do it in-house or whether they refer or whether they just say it's interesting, that's fine. Herbal medicine, on the other hand, historically, historically was, was um, a major concern with that. And it was mine because as a scientist, I, don't, I, I have to show, have be seen the, show, see the data, right? And so as a scientist, I don't have a lot of belief. I have a lot of facts that I, I, I try to understand and then create a, a concept or a, a hypothesis that I can test or I can see or present or, or see whether or not it helps. So one of the key things for me was, are there harmful things that can be harmful in the addition of, of herbal compounds, which are nothing more than the progenitors of, of many, many of the drugs that we use. Are there, are there herbal compounds that 
could negatively influence. Thanks to the change in China now, uh, where IVF is, is being done at enormous numbers in, in many, many different places, there are lots and lots of studies now looking at the addition of Chinese herbs. And all of the studies, of course, come out that they help. Now, you could take that with a grain of salt, but we're not seeing studies which suggest that there's a harm. There are a couple of Korean studies that looked at a couple of herbs that, that could have a negative influence, but it wasn't on reproduction. But really, um, the addition of herbs. Now, how do I use them? Well, again, anything you put in your body, whether it's food, exercise, alcohol, drugs, whatever, it doesn't matter what it is, uh, and it could be pharmaceuticals as well as herbal preparations, can interfere with the normal metabolism, specifically through activating liver enzymes. The liver is the place that considers anything outside the body as foreign and toxic. So it's always doing things to detoxify plant compounds and things like that, pharmaceuticals, um, et cetera. So if you activate with, let's use metformin. I don't wanna use Chinese medicine because then you'll get the wrong impression. Let's say you, you use metformin, which is used by many, many folks for the, for the additional help for PCOS patients to reduce their blood sugars. Well, one of the key things that happens with the use of metformin is the liver enzymes go crazy they actually get to a pathologic level and they can cause problems with the liver itself. So, so you could imagine that if there is a herbal compound that can do the same thing, it would be worrisome. We haven't seen that, we haven't seen that. But so when my patients, if they are patients, this is how I use herbal medicines. I leave it up to a A-born certified uh, acupuncturist to add or subtract herbs as needed because they've trained in Western medicine and in Eastern, and they are Eastern medicine doctors. So they have a keen sense of how these, how our, our pharmaceuticals are used in a, in a, in a stimulation cycle. So that's, so typically um, if you're, um, you're, you refer a patient to me, I'll, tell that patient, please tell your doctor it's okay to use herbs if necessary. In my particular case, my main referral is my wife, Dr. Diane Credenda. She absolutely knows what I do and do not um, like as part of the normal care pattern, but she will contact me or I will contact her and say, listen, we've tried everything with this patient. When I say throw the kitchen sink, please give her maximum uh, you know, herbal preparations that you feel will what? Augment her opportunity for pregnancy. Whether it be that, and, and I was speaking to Diane today because of our talk today, be that something to as a yin tonic, something to you know, liver heat, it doesn't matter what it is, she would look at the constellation, decide what is the patient's problem, and then would manage that as a way of augmenting this patient's uh, fertility. How acupuncture plays a role is acupuncture, one of the three things we've understood with acupuncture, four things we've understood with acupuncture is that one, um, uh, it does create um, better blood flow to, through the uterine artery to the ovary, which means it improves blood flow at the level of the ovary and the cortex, which is like the skin of a peach, uh, but the ovary is like a peach with the meat of the peach being the hormone factory, but that little layer of skin is where, uh, like on a peach, is the cortex of the ovary. That's where the eggs are. And it's very hard for capillaries to get in there to feed the follicles with the FSH hormone to get follicles to grow. With acupuncture, you're improving blood flow, so you, you have neovascularization, so access to eggs. We have found that with estradiol supplementation, we see the same thing, the same type of response, neovascularization. So there's a mechanism. The second mechanism whereby acupuncture can help is it could create quiescence of the uterus after the transfer process or pre and post the transfer process. By quieting the normal uterine contractility, uh, because it doesn't want anything inside the uterus, you may reduce the chance of expulsing the embryo out after it's been placed, or unfortunately shoving it into the fallopian tube where an ectopic pregnancy can occur. So by quieting the uterus itself, you, you may improve. So that's what acupuncture can do. Third, we found that two stress hormones are associated with uh, 
which is funny, reductions in two stress hormones will negatively affect reproductive outcomes. So what we have found is acupuncture will bring back the normal physiology of cortisol and prolactin levels to a pro-pregnancy uh, level. Whereas our medications will suppress the adrenal glands as well as the, 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 the hypothalamic pituitary axis and we'll see a diminution in these hormones which are required for implantation in a normal pregnancy. So acupuncture has many roles. The Chinese have looked at a lot of the nutrients, I'm sorry, the, the, the herbal compounds that have been used for, for thousands of years to help fertility. They've, they're beginning to ask the question, can we also either substitute for drugs like clomiphene, metformin or others or letrozole and add these, these herbal preparations or additionally adding these, will they show some sort of an effect? And what is the effect? The effect is to turn on and off our, our, it's called epigenetics, to turn on and off our genome to produce the kind of things that allow us to be healthy or remain capable of handling the stresses of life. So it can be done through drugs, it can be done through herbs, it can be done through acupuncture, it can be done through exercise, it can be done through the addition of growth hormones. All of these, when put together, will make your patient fit for their fertility. Thank you very much for this. Let's talk about the last little piece of the equation. So to get a really healthy embryo, which will turn into a live birth, you've talked a lot about the egg. And so what does the guy do? What's yeah. his role? Yeah. Well, first and foremost, um, the sperm is the sentinel for reproductive safety. Um, in other words, um, let me tell a quick uh, story I've made up uh, to explain it. As hunter-gatherers, we're always moving to a place that's going to be able to provide food, water, shelter, um, and a place for reproduction to occur. And the food, water, and shelter are geared towards perpetuating the species. What's interesting about male physiology is that it takes approximately 70 to 90 days for the sperm to go from the testicles to the ejaculate. So um, the way I envision it is, in the old days, they didn't have cars and planes, so you, you, you'd have the, the chief or his team scouts go out to find a place. They would go there, they would find a place, and they would gradually bring uh, the spouses or the, the females there, and they would see what happened. They would look at the next season. And if the next season, none of the women got pregnant, they would say, we need to move on. They would understand something about that. Well, my understanding it is, is that, and this has been shown, is that the sperm are extraordinarily sensitive to environmental toxins. So what is an environmental toxin in, in Vancouver? Alcohol, tobacco, street drugs, you know, um, excessive exercise, um, poor sleep habits, stress, you know, typical Canadian lifestyle. All of these things where you could have as, as problems to reproduction, that's a joke, as problems to reproduction. And so what men can do first and foremost is reduce those things. But what is it, what is it about the, the heat and the poor nutrition and the poor sleep? It's oxidation. Oxidation is, is, is a way to, well, we think of oxidation in a, as a form of rust, but it's a way for the body to get rid of problems. And unfortunately, if the oxidation is too high, it gets rid of good cells too, which in this case would be the sperm, making them less functional. So what men can do is add um, uh, nutritional supplements. You know, the, mostly the, most of us think of things like zinc, vitamin C, vitamin A, these are all antioxidants. Now with COVID, D3, you know, high doses of vitamin C. But what men forget is that uh, the, the role of folic acid is for cellular growth. And, and the faster a cell grows, the more folic acid you need. So, so what's the, one of the fastest growing cells in, and the most numerous cells in, in a male's body that's produced every second to the tune of 1,000 per second, and that is sperm. 
So men should absolutely supplement with folic acid uh, and avoid alcohol, tobacco, drugs, hot tubs, those kinds of things. So folic acid, antioxidants of every sort, um, adequate rest, and then what is nutrition? Well, men do extraordinarily well with a high protein, moderate, moderate um, uh, fat and moderate carbohydrate diet. They just do because they have more muscle mass. Well, what did we talk about before about proteins? They increase growth hormone. Exercise increases. Now, exercise to an excess creates oxidative radicals. So that's not good either. So modulating their exercise in moderation would probably be a good thing. Hydration, dehydration, uh, both female and males are specifically uh, um, impacted the cells with dehydration. So men can have can create poor sperm properties or semen properties, the, the thing that carries the sperm, simply by being dehydrated. So keeping a man's well hydrated. What is well hydrated? It's in the morning, the pee is yellow and you pee four to six times a day and the pee is clear. If it's dark and smelly, you are dehydrated no matter how much fluid you're drinking, double it. Um, Although so, with some of the uh, vitamins like bees, it will stay yellow. Uh, thank you. Uh, the point is, uh, Lauren's making is that the niacin in the B vitamins will create yellow urine, but that should be just in the morning once. Then after that, through the day, because you know, normally you take your vitamins in the morning or before you go to bed. Um, but yes, that can cause that bright yellow, but not the smelly dark yellow, which is just simply metabolic breakdown products. Um, so getting the man to understand that his sperm play a huge role in miscarriage rates. And, and that's a hard thing because everyone considers the female responsible for miscarriages, but it turns out that due to these changes in the, in the sperm DNA itself, due to epigenetics or outside influences, environmental influences, the, the, the impact on reproduction is not only in reduced fertility, but reduced fecundity, which is not getting a baby. So you can get pregnant, but if you keep miscarrying, you're still not winning that race. So the man has lots to do. So the man has lots to do. And we, you've said this, but we're just going to say it again. So for women that um, are trying to create a family and their partner is, uh, is male, um, men can be involved in the embryo quality. That's what you're saying. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, the man can be involved in why we don't have implantation or why we have miscarriages. Yes. And... Mm -hmm. Do you guys have, is it easy to assess? Because a lot of the women will say, well, we did a semen analysis and they said everything's normal. Okay, so, so here, here's the book by its cover analogy. I've bought many books where I looked at the cover and someone spent a lot of money getting an artist to, to draw this amazing picture on the cover of the book. And once I started reading it, the book was crap and I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't get through the first chapter. So that's like judging a book by its cover. So how tall you are, how much muscles or count motility and the shape of the sperm, those are nothing, nothing more than um, um, the beauty pageant of, uh, you know, a play a musical instrument, wear a bikini or wear a, a ballroom gown. That says nothing about the person. Just like those parameters they're interesting and they are suggestive, suggestive of the performance of sperm, but they are absolutely not one-to-one -one correlations. So a normal semen analysis does not portend for pregnancy. It just says, compared to other men, he has X amount of sperm. Compared to other men, he has X amount swimming. Compared to other men, he has X amount that are normal shaped. And historically, that is associated with women who've, with couples who've had children, but it absolutely does not talk about function. And so in your clinical practice, um, are you encouraging, recommending men still do the dietary lifestyle and take supplements regardless of semen analysis oh, if the goal is a healthy baby? Life totally, life? totally. It's a healthy body is a fertile body. It's very simple. And a healthy baby, is a function of two healthy gametes, right? Sperm and egg. That's how that baby be gets their initial um, uh, 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 health. And uh, it's prenatal gene, right? Is that is that the term? 
We call that prenatal gene. What the mother and father give is prenatal. And then after the birth is what we call postnatal gene. What the baby eats is, is exposed to. But until the birth, even during the pregnancy, that is still prenatal. And in the West, we would call this the epigenetic impact from exactly. sperm and egg and during gestation. That's exactly right. So, so, so how we use our understanding of traditional Chinese medicine is the, the, the foundational knowledge that we use to explain phenomena in Chinese medicine can be re, and this is what I do in all of my lectures, can be reshaped into a Western understanding. It can be, it's not magic, it's not woo woo. There are ways of, of correlating, creating analogies. And so this, is the, this has been the pleasure of working with acupuncturists uh, is that they see things differently. They, th they see it through a different filter. And, and as you know, light is made of many, many, many colors and we see it as, as, as white and green and yellow, but you change the filter and you may see some pathology or you may see some health uh, avenue. That's how putting these together helps. Thank you very much. So I guess our take home message here is if your goal is live birth and to optimize your fertility um, leading up to whether you're trying to conceive naturally or with IVF, preconception, in my clinic, we often say 100 days, as in mm -hmm. 100 days to peak fertility. So making these changes, diet, lifestyle, leading up to that IVF process or while you tr continue to try to conceive naturally. And there's integrative approaches. So a clinic like Dr. Magarelli at CNY Fertility in Colorado, we have all of fertility here in Vancouver that is integrated with our clinic, AccuBalance. And if you're looking for the practitioner, the acupuncturist that is knowledgeable in acupuncture fertility and is knowledgeable in Western reproduction because they passed a board exam for that, you can check out the American Board of Oriental Reproductive Medicine website because these acupuncturists have written board exams to show that they have minimal knowledge in Chinese medicine and Western medicine for reproductive health. And there's lots of things that you can do. Unfortunately, the only thing we can't make you younger chronologically, if you're 38, we can't turn you to 30. But Dr. Mag and I have talked before, if you're 38 chronologically, but biologically you're behaving 45, you can become biologically 38 again, which would be in your favor trying to conceive naturally or through an IVF. So anything you want to add? Otherwise, I know you got to go back in, into um, doctoring. <laughs> well, the key thing is the mechanism by which a lot of this works is through a, a, an organelle called the mitochondria or the battery of the cell. And both Western and, 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 and traditional Chinese medicine, as many other medicine modalities, have been shown to influence the health and wellness of the mitochondria, much like influencing the charge or discharge of a battery, whether you have a Tesla or a flashlight. By recharging with nutrition and rest and sleep and nutraceuticals and acupuncture and herbs and, and, um, and lifestyle, that ener the energetics of that are required for the embryo to create the baby. It's all there, but if it starts off deficient, it's not likely to, to end the race uh, capable of achieving the race, which is a healthy human being. So there are mechanisms, they aren't that much different. They all work the same, physiology is physiology. Uh, but I, and so if you can, as a, as, a, as a patient, do the 90 days of prep. I, we say 90, 100 is the same. So let's say 100 days of prep. If you can do that prep, great. However, the key thing is you're losing 10,000 eggs a month. So it's critical to not just take time to do this prep. You could do it simultaneously with some treatments. Definitely. Yeah. So I, thank you for clarifying that. One is, is it 10,000 or 1,000 eggs you're losing a month? It's 1,000 eggs a month prior to age 35, 10,000 once you turn 35 and older. So time becomes a little more tight. So, so and as we weren't suggesting you stop things, but simultaneously while you're trying, you can keep being proactive. And the mitochondria, that battery to cell, that's where we've had the discussion of using laser acupuncture known as photobiomodulation. Mm -hmm. Because yes. again, if we can work with that mitochondria, that's the energy that's going to have the embryo divide early on and the right. energy for implantation. So for another discussion, 
All right, you can check out Dr. Maragarelli. He's CNY Fertility in Colorado. So if you're looking for that integrative approach where your REI is going to do all the stuff he can from a Western perspective to optimize egg quality, check out his website. And if you want integration, um, his clinic is fully, does the integration. And we do the same thing here in Vancouver. You can contact us at AccuBalance or if a practitioner shared this video, it's likely they're doing integrative medicine as well. So um, check them out um, also. Thank you very much, Dr. Meg. Thanks, Lauren. I really appreciate it. Good to see you. You too.